Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 26. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. Hey there, everybody. I am Jay Scott. I am your co-host for the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast here again this week with my lovely co-host who just got back from the dentist, Mrs. Carol Scott. How are you doing today, Carol? <laughs> that was the scariest thing. I am so dental phobic. It is absolute torture. But now I am thirsty. You ready to go have a glass of wine? Or many. I'm ready to have many, many, many glasses of wine after that horrendous experience to make it all better. Uh, you, you like how we, we did that lead in? Okay, so that's a good lead in for today's guest. We have two awesome guests today. We have a guy named Michael Houlihan and his partner, Bonnie Harvey, and they are the founders of the single largest wine brand on the planet. Barefoot Wines. And they're going to tell us about how back in the mid 80s, they accidentally came upon this business venture. They started it, they grew it, they scaled it, and they eventually sold it about 20 years later. And they then moved on to their next ventures. So they have some amazing actionable tips for how you can grow your brand, how you should be marketing and distributing and merchandising your products. And it's just an all around fantastic episode. So I think you guys are going to love it. And now let's jump into our interview with Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. So let's welcome to the show, Michael and Bonnie. How are you guys doing today? Hey, we're excellent. How about you guys? Great. Great. We are Go doing ahead. awesome, awesome, awesome. We are so <laughs> thrilled to have you here. Uh, I, we were talking before the show started that Carol and I first heard your story probably about six months ago on another podcast. And for the last six months, we've been saying we have to, have to, have to have you guys on the show. So we are thrilled to have you here. Thank you for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. So Michael, Bonnie, we want to dig into all aspects of your journey. You have such an amazing story to share. I mean, you've built this leading global wine brand from the ground up. You've written a New York Times bestseller. You've mentored and you've consulted with and coached and spoken at some of the most influential, influential companies and universities around the world. You've incorporated social awareness along the way. You've launched another business venture just recently. So many amazing things there that we want to unpack. But before we get into that, we would love for you to give our listeners some context. So we'd love for you to talk a little bit about what the Barefoot Spirit is and what that means to you, what that brand is all about today. Well, the Barefoot Spirit started when we had Barefoot Wines, and we kind of realized what it meant as the wine product evolved. And what it came to mean was basically that it's all inclusive. So when you're walking down a beach and you see bare feet, footprints in the sand, you don't know if it's male, female, black or white. You don't know if they're gay or straight. You don't know the age, Muslim or Jew. You don't know. It's all inclusive. And that's a big part of the barefoot spirit. It's friendly. It's easy to embrace. Um, and it's just really having fun. That's a big part of it. There's more though, Michael, go ahead. Well, yeah, there's a lot more. <laughs> the barefoot spirit is really a style of doing business and it's an attitude and uh, it involves certain values. You know, probably one of the biggest overarching values is one you've heard a thousand times, but at the barefoot spirit, we break it down into practicality. Uh, but it is put yourself in the other guy's shoes Yes. And you might say, oh, well, that's the golden rule. I've heard that before. Well, <clears throat> what does that mean in terms of your relationship with your employees? What does that mean in terms of your relationship with your vendors and the people that have loaned you money? Uh, what does that mean in terms of the relationship that you have with your customers? So when you start getting, you know, tactile about it and practical, then you start to develop actual procedures for how you handle these people. And that is really a big part of the barefoot spirit. It's building a team 
where everybody on the team knows that you have their best interests at heart. I absolutely love that. Okay, so I, I'm familiar with the Barefoot story because I've listened to you before. I know Carol's as well, but I, I know our listeners are going to love this story. Can you take us back? Where did Barefoot Wine come from? How did you guys come to take over this brand, to uh, I sort of take over, sort of start and grow this brand? Can you tell us the Barefoot story? Well, Michael and I were living here in Sonoma County, beautiful wine country, but not because we were wine drinkers or lovers, but because we love the country and the ocean. And this is where we met. I had a client, we were both business consultants. I had a client who was a grape grower who hadn't sold, well, hadn't been paid for his grapes in three years. He'd sold them, (laughs) but there was no money coming in from that. So I uh, realized that he was owed $300,000, and I thought, well, let me take a look at the contract. Let's see what we can do. And my client said, well, there's no contract. I don't have anything in writing. And well, that's a bit above my head. So I gave the challenge of collecting $300,000 for my client to my new boyfriend over here. (laughs) I said, you go out and collect the money, okay? And, you know, I just met this gal, right, at this rock and roll nightclub. And, you know, less than a year later, she's got me out collecting 300 large. (laughs) (laughs) Bonnie, you know what you want and you just make it happen. You're like, Michael, I got a job for it. So the day I got to the the winery, uh, the guard stopped me and he says, I hope you're not here to collect any money. He said, because this morning we filed a chapter 11, you're just going to have to take your ticket and wait your turn with the rest of us. That's bankruptcy, you know. Wow. That's yep. bankruptcy in California, chapter 11. And so I thought for a minute, gee, you know, should I turn around and go back? Or, you know, so I went ahead with the meeting and I was sitting there with these guys. And, uh, you know, I didn't have much to say because I knew they didn't have any money. So I thought I'd make some small talk. And I said, hey, what's going on with those tanks out there? And they said, oh, well, they're filled with bulk wine, Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc. And I was thinking to myself, isn't that funny? Those are the same two varietals of wine, Cab and Sauvignon Blanc, that you owe our client for and haven't paid him. So I look out this other window, and I'm looking down into this room that's below the meeting room where we are through these glass windows. And it looks like a big handball court. And in the middle of it is this chrome machine. It's polished. It's got tracks on both sides of it. So I say, hey, what's with the chrome locomotive in the handball court? And, you know, they laughed and they said, oh, no, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bottling line and it's in a clean room. And that's where we do our bottling. And then it hit me like a chrome locomotive. And I said, <laughs> I said, hey, guys, I said, what do you think of this idea? What if we take some of that wine you've got in those tanks over there and run it through the chrome locomotive down here? And instead of paying us in money, you pay us in bottled wine, you know? And that's we'll right. come up with a label and a marketing program, a distribution program, and everything else. <laughs> how hard could that be? And how long could that take? So, easy, so. Easy. So basically, you started out on a mission to basically make yourselves or your client whole, just get the 300000 you're owed, and you walk out with a business, with a potentially a, a, a new venture. So Exactly. You know, people say, follow your passion. Um, some of us follow our opportunity, mm-hmm. uh, but we followed our opportunity passionately. So we never gave up on our passions and we actually imbued them into our business. And that gets back to the barefoot spirit. You know, what are your values? What, what, you know, what would make your tail wag? You know, we'll then offer that to the other dog, you know? <laughs> so, so this is the kind of attitude that we had and we didn't know what we were doing. And, you know, when I told Bonnie, I said, Hey, we got all this wine. We got all this bottling services, you know, it's better than a stick in the eye. And uh, what did you say? You well, said, I said, well, that's not going to pay any bills. <laughs> now we've got to get a license. We've got to find out what the market wants. We've got to create a label. We've got to sell this stuff. Where do we, I guess we'd better get going. <laughs> I guess we have some work to do. So you were a business consultant at the time, Bonnie. So you just intuitively knew that those were all the steps that were necessary or, or I mean, it sounds like. I've been working. Yeah. I've been working with small businesses long enough that I understood there were many steps. That, I understood that a lot of businesses that uh, are producing a great product 
just aren't really doing well because they don't know how to manage the inside of the office or even manage their own inventory. So that's what I was doing previously. Michael was also a business consultant, more look, working with the government and land splits and contracts and things like that. So, so a, a large part of starting a successful business is the branding, is the logo, is the customer and, and outside facing or, or face of the business. So can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with the name Barefoot, how you came up with the logo? I, I know uh, I'm, I'm leading you here a little bit because I know the answer to the question, uh, but I'd love to hear more about, or I'd love for our listeners to hear more about how you came up with the name and the specific logo that, that you now have. Well, we set about asking a lot of questions of a lot of people, anybody that would possibly touch our product along the line. And we asked the bottling line manager what the label should look like. And he gave us advice saying it should look clean, the font should really show, and that it should have a little white edge around the outside. So if it gets the label gets scuffed, it won't look like damaged product, things like this. That was all priceless. Uh, we asked a lot of people out in the market, the stock boys, forklift drivers at warehouses, the best information, we used it all, but the best information we got was from Don Brown, who uh, was a chain store buyer here in California. See, plan A was to bottle it all up and sell it to a chain store. So we went to the largest chain store, which was Safeway, at the, or Lucky's at the time here in California. And Michael went in there and he asked the largest buyer of wine in the state of California, what do you want? And the buyer said, well, nobody's ever asked me that before. Oh, aha moment. What a new concept, right? Aha, uh -huh, big time. And we've been asking oodles of questions ever since. But he gave us some real gems. Well, you know, he was kind of a, he was kind of the imperfect Buddha type of a guy. You know, he's very snarky and gruff, you know, grumpy kind of guy. And uh, he wanted to get me out of his office as fast as he could. <laughs> and <clears throat> so he said, listen, he says, uh, you know, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta uh, make it a salt and pepper act. Uh, you gotta put it in a pig. You gotta make it better than Bob and cheaper than Bob. And I'm writing this down. He says, "You got that?" And I said, "Yeah." He says, "Can you do that?" I said, "Yes, we can of do." Of course, that. of course, we can do no, that. No, no problem. So you know, I I'm halfway down the hall, and he says, "Hey, Houlihan." He says, "One more thing." He says, "On that label, he says, don't make it a tree, don't make it a leap." Don't make a castle. Don't put it in French. Put it in plain English. Make sure the logo is the same as the name and make sure it's visible from four feet away. And I mean, talk about unpacking, you know, and I'm sitting there going, uh -huh, okay, I got that. So I had to go translate that. So I went to my friend who was in the industry and I said, hey, what's the salt and pepper act? He says, oh, that's easy. He says, that's the same brand with two varietals. Like, you know, pepper would be like a Cabernet Sauvignon a red, red, wine. A red wine and the salt would be like Sauvignon Blanc, a white wine. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, you know, uh, tell me, you know, uh, who, who's Bob anyway? Uh, he says, oh, that's Robert Mondavi. <laughs> And I said, oh, you got to be kidding gosh. me. I got to be better wow. than, cheaper than Robert. Huh? And so I said, pray tell me one last thing. I said, what is a pig? He says, oh, a pig. He says, that's the big 1.5 liter Magnum. That's not the 750 that everybody thinks about as the standard wine bottle. This is the big fat one, the pig. I said, oh, and it dawned on me that he had given us the keys to the kingdom, snarky as he was. On my way out the door in 37 seconds, he just rattled it off. Look, look, guy, if you want to do this, this is what you got to do, right? And this is coming from like years of experience, you know. But if we were in the wine industry, we would have made all decisions and then gone down to a, a Don Brown or whoever buyer and said, here's our product, buy it, and then given him the features and benefits. So we did it in reverse. And that's also part of the barefoot spirit, which is, you know, find a market for what you're selling before you decide what you're selling. <laughs> that is huge. So I have, a, can I, I have a question. What year was this? Well, that was 86. Okay, great. So this is 86. And that's what's so fascinating to me is that right now, obviously, as you know, you go into every store that sells wine and it's doing all of those things 
that you're describing. There's the yes. 1.5 liter magnums everywhere. There are all of the, the names that match the logo. There are the different varietals of those type of things. But that was not standard in 1986. So it sounds like the wine industry was substantially different. And you're talking about castles in trees and things in French. So yeah, back in the day, yeah, yeah, back in the day, it was a whole different it was a whole different aura about wine, right? And you well, managed- Americans were kind of embarrassed and apologizing that they weren't French enough. And it was a very misogynist business. It was like men making wine for other men. And, you know, it was Saturday night wine where the men would sit around and they would talk about things like appellations and, you know, mid notes and that <laughs> sort of thing. But it, it turned out that the majority of the wine buyers was a 37 year old mom with two and a half kids pushing a cart down the, the, the supermarket aisle. And she wanted a Tuesday night wine that tasted the same from year to year that she could depend on like a staple. And so that's what we did. We produced Barefoot as a staple, and it was profiled for the 37-year-old mom. That's great. And, and I, I, it's funny. I'm in my 40s, and I remember growing up, and, and the idea was French wines are wines. And everybody wants to be like the French when it comes to wines. And I didn't know much about wines, but everybody, that's what you talked about. French wines were the wines. Then 30 years later, I moved to California and I'm near Napa, I'm near Sonoma, and everybody's talking about how American wines are now taking over and they're the the wines. I mean, everybody wants American wines. And it's funny because as somebody who was never into wine, I didn't see that transition. But it sounds like you guys and Barefoot Wine was actually part of that transition. You guys yeah, drove the, the growth of American wines. And a lot of that was strictly by accident, not just accident. I mean, you were in the right place at the right time, but you asked the right questions, you listened, you worked hard. And I mean, literally we can credit the two of you for making to a large extent, American wines, what they are today. So it's it's really, thank thank you. It's really interesting because when we started, they said, well, you're cheapening wine. You're taking away the mystery. You know, you're going to wreck our margins, right? Because where there's mystery, there's margin. And we said, no, I said, we're going after beer drinkers, martini drinkers, and uh, especially women who don't like wine. So Hmm. what we're doing is we're expanding the wine envelope. 10 years later, fast forward, they're calling us up from their tasting rooms and they're saying, you know, we've got a bunch of people in here that got started on Barefoot (laughs) Wine and now they're buying our $90 bottles. Thank you. You see, Barefoot Barefoot was non-intimidating. At the time, wine was so snobby, people couldn't Mm -hmm. pronounce the words on the label. They didn't know what varietals go with what food. And they just didn't feel that they were educated enough to enjoy a glass of wine. But Barefoot made them feel comfortable. You could pronounce every word. It was Barefoot Cab, Barefoot Blanc, Barefoot Blush, barefoot shard, easy to pronounce, right? Very friendly. And you didn't have to know a lot about wine. You just get barefoot and have a great time. That was our mission statement. That was our motto. I love that. And it, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Bonnie. And there wasn't any other friendly labels on the market at the time. And barefoot was friendly. It was approachable. So that really opened up a lot of people to the idea of, well, I'll give it a try. And many, many people came up to us because we did tastings all over. uh, And they came up and said, this is the first wine I ever tried. That's awesome. You, you basically, you made wine accessible to the masses. Yes. And, right. and, and if you want to make money in business, focus on the masses, not the classes, as, as some people like to say. Um, so I have a question. Uh, Michael, you said where there's mystery, there's margin. I love that saying. Can you, can you expand on that a little bit? Well, you know, there's a term called sophomoric, right? Mm-hmm. Which, which really means that you know enough to, to get in trouble, right? So you know enough French to embarrass yourself or you know enough about wine to embarrass yourself. So the wine industry was deliberately cloaking the whole thing in mystery, because they knew that if people had that kind of mystery confusion going, that they would pay more because there was kind of a magic to it. There was this (laughs) place in wine where you really couldn't 
understand what it was or, you know, how it got there, or maybe you didn't know how to describe it properly, or, or maybe there would be a, a sommelier who would correct you, see. Uh, you'd sit down at dinner and you'd see all these wines, you wouldn't know what to choose, and you'd be afraid if you chose the wrong one. <clears throat> so that's, that added to the mystery, and we have a very good friend, uh, Larry Martin, who's in the travel business. In fact, he, he does food and wine travels all over Europe. Uh, and he's the guy who coined that expression. He said, you know, Michael, he says, you got to remember where there is mystery, there is margin. Because I was complaining to him about how the industry, they wouldn't let us join the Wine Institute. Uh, <clears throat> they, they really had a problem with us. You know, they thought we were just killing the industry. And here we were blowing it up. That's awesome. You totally turned it on its head. So <clears throat> here, here you are just taking away the mystery, just taking this all down so that more people would try wine to expand the whole concept of wine. How did the name Barefoot become the name and where did that amazing label come from? Well, we did have a friend. We thought about this for a very long time and we continued to ask a lot of questions. But we had a friend uh, who uh, made a product called Barefoot Bynum and it had been off the market for about 12 years and it was jug wine when it was produced in Berkeley in the 70s and um, we said well bare feet that's the way grapes were originally crushed to make wine so that relates to the wine and if we called it barefoot as he had done barefoot then we could use the logo and the name would be the same so we made arrangements to use that uh, name we couldn't use the label though because the label was really outdated the foot was at the bottom it was just kind of flat it didn't have any life to it you could just put a tag on the toe and send it back to the morgue <laughs> so, that's appealing <laughs> yeah. so i said what we have to do is we've got to we've got to you know step it up we've got to make it look like it's action so it's you know um an oh, no. italicized exclamation point so it looks like it's really on the move and um i just saw it one night in my head it all kind of came together and i i demanded that michael go and draw it on the chalkboard when i saw it and uh, i said i know what the label looks like so he went to the chalkboard and he drew it and uh, the next morning we put it on a piece of paper and sent it off to the artist and uh she came back with some funny square looking feet and it just <laughs> didn't quite look right so I look human <laughs> Find yeah, it. she says, I can draw anything, just give me a picture. I said, well, where am I going to find a long, thin foot like I want on the label? I, oh, I've got one of those right here on the end of my leg. <laughs> so I put my foot in the biggest ink pad that we could find and put it on some artist paper and sent that off. That's how my foot ended up on the largest wine brand in the world. <laughs> how I awesome is that, right? That Talk about resourcefulness. I love that. <laughs> Okay, so now you have a plan, you have a label, you have a logo, you even have a buyer at Lucky's. What was the next step? How did you grow? How did you scale? How did you turn this, this mm. accidental business into the largest wine brand in the planet? We, we didn't really have a buyer at Lucky's at first, but go so, ahead, Michael. So, <laughs> so we, we bottled it. And we were so proud of ourselves because it was everything he asked for. You know, the name Barefoot was the same as the logo of Barefoot. It was in a pig. It was about the same price as Robert Mondavi red and white in 1.5 liter bottles. Uh, you could see it from uh, four feet away. Uh, it, it was everything he asked for. Um, <clears throat> it was a salt and pepper act. And, and uh, so we put the, the two bottles down on his desk and we said, there you go. Uh, how many truckloads do you want? And we thought, you know, this is plan A. We'll just sell this. We'll make some money, pay off the debt. We'll be down the road. And he looks at us and he says, are you crazy? He says, I can't buy this. He says, you put a foot on it, you know, and, and nobody's ever heard of this. You know, you got to be out of your mind. Are you going to spend a million dollars on advertising? And I said, a million? I said, we don't even have 500, you know, dollars. So... Uh, no, I said, we can't. He says, well, he says, I can't take it. Nobody's going to take it. No box store is going to take it. No chain store is going to take it because nobody's ever heard of it. 
And I said, well, we bottled it all up for you. What are we going to do? <laughs> he says, well, he says, I guess you got to sell to every mama pop and every independent and every corner liquor store because the chains won't take it. And I said, well, that'll take years. He said, that's right. You better get started. And wow. so here we are, you know, out on the street selling it to the mama papas. And they got the same problem that the big buyer had. They say, well, you're going to advertise this? You know, you put a foot on the label. You know, it's kind of crazy. Nobody's ever heard of this. And, you know, I'll tell you what, if it doesn't sell in 90 days, you're out of here. So, like, 30 days went by and we got the reports. There was no sales. No <coughs> Six, reorders. No reorders. In the 10 accounts and then, we had yeah, initially. Yeah, first 10 oh, accounts no. in San Francisco. No orders, right, for 30 days. And so then <coughs> the next the next. 30 days come by, no orders. And we're starting to panic. We're sweating bullets. We're going, uh-oh, this is the end of Barefoot because if you're a non-starter, all your competition tells all the buyers immediately, mm -hmm. don't even try that one. They tried it in San Francisco and it failed, right? right. And so um, we get a call out of the clear blue from a guy who is a uh, uh, who, who community is, leader. He's a community fundraising kind of guy. He's trying to raise money for a kids after school park in Chinatown in San Francisco. And he's looking for $50,000. <laughs> and I ask him if he's got the right phone number because we don't have anything <laughs> like that to give away. But we I told have him. have $50 to spare. <laughs> but, I, but I said, you know what? I said, we'll give you some wine. You can use it at your fundraiser. Maybe to loosen some people up. They'll write a bigger check. Or maybe you can auction it off and, you know, buy some slides and swings in a sandbox. You know, but I mean, we can't give you any money. We can only give you wine. He said, okay. He took the wine begrudgingly. About 30 days later, we get the reports and there's zero sales in the other you know, six accounts, but the four accounts that are near Chinatown are through the roof. The sales are really good. And really? We, we said, what yeah. is going yeah. on here? And we thought, I wonder if the people who were the members of the nonprofit who attended that fundraiser and drank our product with dinner and looked at it for two hours, right, during all the boring speeches, <laughs> went out and bought it at the nearest store when they saw it. And so we said, let's try this in another neighborhood. So we went to this upscale neighborhood, Twin Peaks, and we helped them clean up a creek up there that they were worried about. And we gave mm -hmm. them the money for their fundraiser, and sure enough, sales took off in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, this is a really interesting idea because it's, it's not like advertising where you're shotgun blasting. This is a very targeted form of advertising, if you will, where we're really trying to get the members of the nonprofit to have a social reason to buy our product, which is stronger, of course, than a mercantile reason. And, you know, now they go, they become customers, they become advocates. So that's the technique that we use to build Barefoot across the country yes. and in 28 other countries. Wow. By supporting the small neighborhood fundraisers and nonprofits that were around the markets that had our wine. We called it worthy cause marketing. Mm -hmm. Cause marketing hadn't been uh, defined yet by some smart professor at Princeton, but uh, we called it worthy cause marketing because these were worthy causes and we were marketing to them. So it's interesting because it almost sounds like the reason you weren't selling wasn't because customers tried your product and said, eh, we're not interested in this. It was, unfortunately, wine back then was a very snobby business. And yes. it was, you were either a known brand or you were an unknown brand. If you were unknown, you couldn't get the customers to try you out. And right. once you kind of put your product in front of customers and said, here, it's free, try it, and put them in a situation where not they weren't forced to try it, but where they had no reason not to try it. They did. And they're like, this is really good. And so it turns out, it sounds like that the problem again, wasn't the product. It wasn't the brand. It wasn't anything. It was just that you needed to actually get potential customers the opportunity to try your product. And once they did, they were converted. And you know, this is the thing with most people who get into business, they fall in love with their product or service so much so that they can't imagine that the world isn't going to knock down windows and kick out doors to get to them to buy their product. The fact is that they have to go through some kind of a distribution system. You know, I don't care whether it's, you know, all on software or if it's bricks and mortar, you've got to get through to your customer. 
and you know access to market is the key to success we knew that we had the right formula the guy wouldn't take it because we weren't advertised we weren't known and we went out and it did take about two years for us to do that to become a household word and finally we went in and we said you've got to put it in now you're losing money the broad market which is what they call the mama papas uh, is is going wild with it and you don't have it but yes your point is really well taken uh, this is a situation where uh, entrepreneurs have got to realize that even if they like it their mom likes it and all their friends like mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. they have still got to get it to market great so talk to us more about that distribution system you're saying it took two years and you expanded in a similar method across the country in like into this whole this grassroots method of getting into people's hands through the nonprofits and so on was it the two of you what was your distribution network what did that look like <laughs> well it started off being the two of us but you know very shortly we had to hire people of course and the people that we hired in originally in California and then throughout different states as we expanded, it was their responsibility to work with the distributor, to work with the retailer, and to also work with the community to find out what it was they were interested in. And they made those decisions of what nonprofits to support in their own territory. And they would go to these fundraisers and they would talk with the people. They'd help set up, they'd help break down, They'd ask the fund uh, raising committee for things that cost the fundraiser nothing, such as to display our product, don't put it behind the bar, not show the label, and to allow us to show uh, on the tables or make flyers available of where the product was available within five or 10 miles around where that fundraiser was taking place. And also to announce us in their newsletter, thank us from the podium, all these things that didn't cost them anything. And that way we were able to support their cause, which primarily had to do with uh, environmental issues and and protecting the rights of others and education and music and the arts. And that way we were able to endear ourselves to this group that already existed. So, so many people in the starting business are trying to get followers, but we took other people's followers and, and supported the same things that they were supporting. And that worked very well for us. It was much better than trying to grab one or two here or there on our own and create our own following. But eventually those people were following Barefoot Wines and uh, in addition to the nonprofits they were supporting. Love it. Okay. I could ask another two hours worth of questions about Barefoot Wine. Yeah. I love this story, okay. but but, cool. <laughs> I, I, but I know there is so much more to your story after Barefoot Wine. So I want to get to that because um, I, I want our listeners to hear what came next. But before we do that, I wanna, I'd like to wrap this up a little bit more. Can you tell us a little bit about how big did Barefoot Wine end up growing? What was your exit strategy? Um, and and just, just wrap the story up for us so then we can jump into the next chapter. So um, we wanted to exit from day one, okay? And uh, we take on clients now and advise them. And one of the questions we ask is, you know, have you given any thought to your exit strategy? Uh, and if they haven't, we really can't help them. Uh, but, you know, people say, oh, well, I don't want to sell this business. You know, I have no intention of selling. Well, that might be what you tell your employees. But the fact of the matter is that the day is going to come when you're going to want to uh, you're going to want to monetize on the value of your brand. And so what we're really talking about here is all businesses are brand building businesses. And ultimately the brand gets large enough that it gets the attention of somebody who's collecting brands. And so that's what Barefoot was really designed to do. But the issue is how do you get your peanut in front of that elephant, right? Right. And um, so we deliberately placed our brand in distributors that had the acquirer that we wanted to acquire us uh, represented in those distributorships so that those distributorships would tell them, hey, this stuff is on fire. You guys better take a look at it. Or better yet, if you don't buy it, somebody else is going to buy it. So that was one thing. The other thing we did is, and we recommend this, this is a good takeaway for your audience, is take a broker to lunch. You know, it's really important and do it every year. 
uh, not just any broker, but a, a broker who deals with the sale or the acquisition of your kind of business in your mm -hmm. particular category of business, whatever, whatever you're doing. And ask them a few questions. You know, you, we, we have a list of 30 questions you should ask, but here's a few. Uh, what businesses do you know that are like ours that sold in the last year? How much did they sell for? How many units were they producing? What was their market share? How fast were they growing? And what this does is it gives you a profile of what your goals really need to look like. You can't just sit there and say, well, I think we'll have this goal this year, or I think we'll have that goal. No, the goals are already written. The question is, have you discovered them? See, so you, you say, okay, well, this business sold, it, it had these metrics and it sold, it was 10 years in business and it sold for these, this much money, had these metrics. Okay, if I want to do that or anything close to that, I have to get there. Here's where I am now. Okay, halfway there, maybe I'll do half of the business. So you start to set metrics for yourself based on what you're going to do this year, what you're going to do in six months, what you're going to do in a quarter. So, so instead okay. of just letting things roll out naturally, start with the end in mind and create yes, a plan absolutely. that gets you from where you are today to that mm -hmm. end goal that you've defined up front. And I love the fact that you said when you talk to entrepreneurs today, you start with the question, what's your exit strategy? And if they haven't thought about that, you literally say, I can't help you. It's, it's that important. Well, actually we can because we can help them build their exit strategy. Right. But they, they do have to have one before we can really get going. It's really important. This is, we feel that the best time to start your exit strategies before you even produce your product or service, because you really have to know what the goal is and what's at the end of that big, dark, scary tunnel. <laughs> and uh, that's the way to do it. So we help companies plan for their exit strategy from day one. Or At, from whatever day they're on. <laughs> day whatever. So you had your exit strategy, which was to sell to who? Well, we wanted to sell to Ian e J. Gallo because we respected them. And the reason we respected them is because we were outsiders in the industry. And, you know, when somebody would call us from uh, Des Moines and say, well, your product's just mm -hmm. not selling in this particular store, we'd fly out there to see why. Oh, now most producers would not do that. They just take the excuse. And, and the distributor says, send more samples, lower your price. We want more point of sale material. So we would go out there physically. Yeah. And when we did, we'd see deal. that the potato chips were in front of the barefoot wine. And that's why they didn't yeah, sell. Like, yeah, that's why it wasn't selling. Or, and the no best brainer. merchandisers were the Gallo reps that were out there. Yeah. They were out in the stores. They had a lot of products. They had good shelf space. They were put in the cold box. And um, as Michael was traveling around to more stores, he saw them out there more and more. And he said, well, marketing and uh, merchandising is really key to success. And look how big they've grown. Uh, and we feel that it's due to really strong merchandising. Yeah. So that's why we felt if our product continued to be merchandised properly, it would just skyrocket. So we brought our sales up to 600,000 cases a year. Wow. And we were in all the states, all the military bases, U.S. military bases, 28 foreign countries. And uh, we did it all with only 40 people on our staff. We had 40. 20, 20 salespeople and 20 people that were sales support. See, another, another principle of the barefoot spirit yes. is resourcefulness. Yes. And so you really have to ask yourself, what do I need to own and what do I need to buy? And that's where Contract a, services, a lot of people yeah. try to own production or they uh -huh. try to own a factory or they try to own a, a, a truck or they try to own uh, an office. And guess what? They, those are bills that are hungry for bucks. They're hanging around your neck every month pulling you down. And if you don't have sales, those bills are still there. And so this is what kills the most businesses is they simply don't break even. And so what we advise our clients today is, is to outsource everything except for quality control, sales, and accounting. That's great. And I, I want to step back because there was an important point you made and I just want to highlight it. You talked about 
controlling your own merchandising and not putting the stake of your company, the future of your company in the hands of your resellers, your distributors, your merchandisers, your, um, your end, end sellers. Um, basically, when they told you things weren't selling, you didn't just say, oh, okay, tell us what we have to do differently. You actually took control and said, I'm going to go see why things aren't selling. And, and so too many business owners in that situation, it's easy to say, well, I trust my reseller. I just trust my distributor. I trust the stores to tell me that, oh, I just need a different label or I need a different, different pricing. And, and you're turning over control of your business, of your future to people that don't necessarily have your best interest in mind and may not be smart enough, may not know enough about your business. So keep control and don't trust other people when it comes to your brand and your business and your future. Yes, that's very well put. Nobody's as concerned about your product or your service as you are. And they've got a lot of other products in their book to, to deal with. And the only way you're going to get attention is by working with them, by giving them what they want. Put yourself in their shoes. Find out what it is that they need. Well, they need help selling the product. They need a little financial support. A little, they're all coin operated, right? The retailers, what they want is they want a, a decorated a area of their store. So we'd put in colorful point of sale material. What our end a user, our consumer wanted is they wanted uh, something that was easy to find on the shelf. They wanted something that they could rely on that would taste the same year after year. They wanted something that was friendly where they could pronounce all the words on the label. So everyone had something different that they were looking for. And we eventually learned how to find out what that was and to give it to them. That's that is awesome. so great. Spirit again, right? There it is. It's just, it's just woven throughout every aspect of the story, every aspect of the way you do business on a daily basis. And it just continues all the way through. So you exit, um, you sell to Gallo in what year? 2005. 2005, you sold to Gallo after you'd built this amazing international brand. And you'd already been in the business for almost 20 years at that. Am I doing my math correctly? 20 right. years. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, but, but, but you weren't done. You're like, well, well, we did this and we built this amazing thing, but now we have so much more to offer. So tell us more. What's, what was your next chapter? What, what did Bonnie and Michael say was their calling after they already accomplished this amazing thing? What'd you do? Well, well I, I couldn't say it was our calling, but we were called. Yeah. <laughs> our staff originally said, you guys have to write a book. We've never worked for a company before or since Barefoot. and it was a team that worked so well together. They all loved working together. It was productive. It was fun. And because of the your company culture and because of the success, and you did things so differently than what was going on in the industry, you really have to put it in a book and share it with others. So the first thing we did is we wrote the book called The Barefoot Spirit, How Hardship, Hustle, and Heart Built America's Number One Wine Brand. Very so cool. Oh, go ahead, Michael. And, and, and then what happens is <clears throat> it becomes a New York Times bestseller. Oh, yeah, of course. And, you know, we're thrilled. Um, and so we start speaking. We start speaking all over the world. We speak in 60 schools that teach entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. The students are like in their 30s, their master's degree, or they're coming back into school. And uh, we start to realize, of course, times are changing quickly technologically right mm -hmm. now. Things are changing very fast. Um, one day, you know, people show up at our lecture and they all got earbuds on. And we mm -hmm. thought, well, you know, what are you guys listening to? Is it rap? Is it rock and roll? Is it hip hop? What is it? And they said, no, we're listening to uh, a podcast on how to improve our business. We are, no kidding, you know, <laughs> and this is this interesting. And another person said, oh, I'm listening to a business book, you know. And so um, we got into it. We started to, we got excited about audio because with podcasts, with the MP3 format, you can listen to it when you want. In the old days, you had to listen to it when it was broadcasted, you know. And then we went to cassettes and whatnot. You could, you could buy cassettes and put them in your dashboard and listen to them, you know, on a long drive, right? Uh, but now you can buy a book that's broken up into segments and listen to a segment at a time, kind of like a series, which is, which is really cool. So we said, well, why don't we do an audio book? We wanted to get our message <coughs> out to the greatest number of people. 
because we really did learn things the hard way. It took a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of anguish and pain. And we want to help entrepreneurs to succeed faster. And if they see the, the trials and tribulations that we went through and the challenges and how we approach them, then that's going to help them succeed faster. We wanted to reach a greater number of people. When we saw the earbuds, we said, well, we're going to do an audio book out of the barefoot spirit. So I what love we, this. So, so what we did was we, we, got a, we got some audio books. We started listening to them. And what we found was that they were basically being read to you by a narrator. Or well, maybe the narrator was a movie actor or some great sports person, but it was still a narrator. And we thought, you know, this isn't as much fun as like Prairie Home Companion, right? Where you, you, you know, you got Guy Noir, Private Eye, and you can hear these actors and the sound effects and the music and all that. And it's more of a cinematic performance for your ears. And we thought, well, let's, let's do that with a business book. And it hadn't really been done. There's one site out there that we really love called Business Wars that does something like this. But we wanted to do a business bio that took you into the office. It took you into the buyer's uh, you know, desk. It, it took you into the warehouse. It took you to the parking lot or all the places where business takes place. And you would hear the characters talking to each other. And as a result of the dialogue, you would draw out the conclusions. So it's the opposite of prescription. We're not saying, here's the three things, the five things, and the 12 things, right? We're just saying, here's the story. And so, you draw your own conclusions. So that's what we did. And we're really excited about it. We just released it uh, mm -hmm. on the 3rd, right? Of mm -hmm. September. 3rd of September. And yeah. We have about 20 different actors that are playing the various parts. There's lots of dialogue in the book, and so they're speaking them out, and uh, it's really well done. Oh, we've got sound effects, original music score. It's, it's very fun. Yeah. So, so it's, it's business learning through narrative. I, I love that. Um, and, and I know a lot of people... They don't like textbooks. They don't like quote unquote business books, but this is, this is narrative form. So it's basically, it's a story and, and people can learn using real stories and, and, and real life uh, examples. I love that. Yeah, well, like exactly. we, wanted to, we wanted to bring fun to the wine business. Now we're trying to bring fun to the business education business. <laughs> and, 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 and what's the name? It's called the barefoot spirit. Okay, the barefoot spirit, and um, I know we'll talk about it later. But for anybody that's interested, where where can they get it? Everywhere. Okay. <laughs> where, wherever you pick up your audio books, it's for sale all over the world. That's it's awesome. really cool, and I just love this whole the whole evolution of the Bonnie and Mike story together. Right? You you are business consultants. You had this. You found this this need. You created this global product. You this amazing leading brand. You took that to the next step and you, you decided to start coaching and speaking and mentoring and teaching. And then you realized there was another greater need, right? Like you said, you really realized everyone had earbuds. Audio is a whole new medium. You just don't stop. You just don't rest on your laurels. You just keep evolving, keep spreading that message, keep teaching that people keep helping and empowering and inspiring people. And I think, uh, I have listened to a bunch of excerpts from the audiobook, yeah, and it's, oh, it's, oh, it's, it's awesome. For anyone who hasn't listened to it yet, highly recommend it. It is absolutely awesome, and it's just, it's really spinning, it's, it's really spinning, again, everything on its head, just like you did with the wine brand, where before, learn, uh, wines were, were stuffy, wines were French, wines were a mystery. A lot of business education has been not necessarily a mystery, but there's, like you said, it's done very formally. It's done through group leadership exercises and so on, but you've realized this way to, uh, to bring it more to the masses, to make it more fun, to make it more engaging. So I think that's just yes. a really important point as part of the barefoot spirit. You're constantly evolving. You're constantly changing. You're constantly looking to see what needs and opportunities are out there, what people are looking for, and how you can help bring them value. Thank you very much, Yes, Meryl. thank you. And you can hear samples of the book. Where do they go, Michael? They, can go, they can go to, if they just want to hear samples, they, and they can also buy it at this site. It's called, uh, it's called Barefoot Audio Book. 
barefootaudiobook.com. Barefoot audiobook. Yeah. And you know, you'll hear samples and you can buy it if you want. But uh, it's we wanted to make it kind of like a business adventure story, you know, a seat uh -huh. your oh, pants yeah. ride where, oh, you yeah. know, you, you're kind of pulling through these people, but they make these huge mistakes and boy, it really costs them a lot of money and, you know, they waste a lot of time and then they have to pick themselves up and get going again. And uh, throughout this whole thing, the thing that keeps them going is this barefoot spirit, which yes. is, you know, hey, after all, you know, let's have some fun with this, you know, let's learn from this. You know, we believe that if we make the other guy happy, that we're going to succeed. Love it. Okay, so we have a lot of entrepreneurs out there, and I'm sure if if I asked you to to summarize uh, your advice for new entrepreneurs, you could probably spend the next six or ten hours because uh, this is what you do for a living. Um, but if if I said just give us a couple really great tips, I'm a I'm a new entrepreneur. Let's say I'm trying to get my business off the ground. What are some of the things you've learned that you would love to relay to the next generation of, of entrepreneurs who are, are trying to accomplish the same thing you guys did? Well, one thing is you can fall in love with your product and everybody can love it, but that doesn't mean it's going to sell. You really have to have a good marketing plan. You've got to make people aware of your product. You've got to get it out there and you have to manage uh, the distribution system, the retail system, and the expectations of your end user. And I would add to that uh, an, an, another soundbite, uh, which is... Uh, you know, start slow, uh, make your mistakes in a small place. We like to say, don't sell your product any further from your house than you can drive and apologize and get home in one day. Because you really want to know what's wrong with your product. You really want to know what's wrong with the system. And you really want to know what the real work is that you'll be asked to do mm -hmm. to be a success. It may not be, as our case, it wasn't at all. We never thought we'd be pricing items in Tallahassee, Florida, on our knees on the linoleum, you know, in a public store when it was yep. 87 degrees outside and 90% humidity. You know, we didn't think that that was going to happen. But that happened a lot. And if we didn't do it, nobody did it, and there was no sales. Mm -hmm. So you can't have this attitude, I'm the CEO, this is my business, I'm the boss. No, you have to be <laughs> humble and pretty much say, what do I have to do mm -hmm. to be a success? You know, what is going on with this marketplace before I got there that makes it uh, necessary for us to negotiate it in a certain way? Those rules are already set. What are those rules? So that would be my advice uh, to people starting out is to really understand the marketplace. Don't listen to the VCs that say scale fast and fail fast. You know, that's easy for them to say they got the money, but you'll be failed. How, how about, you know, start slow and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, never lose it, you know. Love that. And I just want to go back because uh, th this was, I, 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 this is probably one of the best quotes that I've heard in a Ever. long, long time. <laughs> Don't sell your product any further from your home that you can drive, apologize and get home on the same day. I love that. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah, Such it, a huge nugget. It, it's, it's, it's be, be involved in your business, take control of your business and, and, and mm -hmm. don't rely on others. That's awesome. Yes. So awesome. Michael, Jay Bonnie. Yes. I think it's about time we move to four more. What do you think? I was just about to say that. What a coincidence. Okay. <laughs> Bonnie, Michael, we're going to go to the segment of our show now before we wrap up that we call four more. There are four kind of rapid fire style questions that we ask each of our guests. Okay. That so we're going to ask you answers. four. <laughs> we're going to ask four. And then at the end, you're going to tell us a little bit more about where we can find out more about you. Are you ready? Okay. Fair enough. Okay, awesome. Bonnie, I'd like the first one to go to you, okay? Okay. What was your first or your worst job, and what lessons did you learn from it? Well, my first job was Arthur Murray Dance Studio. Wow. No way. I, I got to call up people, cold call them on the phone, and offer them free dance lessons. You do enjoy dancing, don't you? <laughs> what I learned from that was to keep people on the positive side, set up a question where they would answer yes, and also to use humor to get them engaged. Awesome. Love it. 
Okay. Second question. We'll make this one for you, Michael. What was the defining moment where you realized that you had the entrepreneurial itch that you really wanted to be an entrepreneur? Well, I was working for the federal mm -hmm. government. I had a bureaucratic job. Uh, you know, I was making lots of money. I had, you know, a future ahead of me, uh, lots of security. And uh, I realized that I was totally ineffectual. And uh, I was not going to get uh, a promotion unless my boss, you know, keeled over. And so I had to wait for that to happen. <laughs> and I also realized that for a guy like me who wanted to really make change happen, that that wasn't the environment for me. Uh, and it wasn't just, it wasn't just the job. It was the idea of having the job. So that's when I kind of had a revolution in my brain. I said, you know, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of the workplace. I'm not really a Johnny paycheck kind of a guy, you know, I'll take the risk. And, and that's when I knew. Excellent. Okay. The third one, I would like you each to answer Bonnie first. Okay. Third question is, what is something that you know now that you wish you would have known back when you started Barefoot a long, long time ago? Well, we started listening to self-improvement tapes and business tapes and how to communicate with people. And when we started off, we thought, okay, we've got an excellent gold medal winning wine at a low price with a really cute foot on the label. <laughs> And if you don't want to buy it, well, what's wrong with you? Well, that was not the right attitude. So after listening to some of these tapes, we realized you've got to find out what it is that that person wants. And they're not interested in any of those things. What they're interested in is bringing people into their store, making their job easier by color coding the boxes, uh, bringing in the community by supporting their causes. So it's all about the other guy. It's not about you at all. <laughs> it's not about you. No. <laughs> Very, who would have thought? And what about you, Michael? Do you have one to add to that? Well, I would just say, you know, and it's on the same vein. Uh, I wish that I had realized that it wasn't, uh, you know, features and benefits that was going to sell the product. And, you know, I wish that somebody had told me, look, the distribution system is more important than your product. If somebody told me that I probably wouldn't have believed them. Mm -hmm. But you know, you go to Ace Hardware and you see all these kind of like, you know, lackluster products. Guess what? They have excellent distribution. So this is the thing. It's, it's not about quality. It's about whether or not you can manage the system. And I didn't know that. I, I thought it was all about quality and price. Oh, nope. getting it in people's hands, right? No, that that's great. I mean, it's it it's if if a worse salesperson, worse distri or worse product can outsell a better product if it has good distribution. That's, yep. that's absolutely correct. Yes. That's fantastic. Okay, last question. I'd love for both of you to answer this. This is Carol's favorite question. But what is something you splurged on either in your personal life or your professional life that was totally worth it? Uh, well, we set up a trip uh, a whole month that we went to Chile. Oh. And, and we bought the tickets and I made sure one thing I'd learned before, you've got to make the tickets non-refundable. So you got to go. As business owners, you know, things come up all the time to cancel your trip. So it was really worth it. We went to Chile for a full month and just had a blast. And that was outside of our budget at the time. However, coincidentally, because we bought the tickets so much in advance, it happened to take place really coincidentally right after we sold our business. So suddenly we did have the wow. money to, to go. <laughs> it was spend a whole month. Yeah. That is an it awesome really celebration, right? <laughs> and I think you had a really good tip in there too for business owners. And honey, why haven't we thought of this? Make your trips non-refundable. That way you just yeah, yeah, make absolutely. yourself take time off because you need that re, we need the re-energizing time. Uh, we're going to have to steal that. We're going to have to steal that one. Love it. Totally stolen. Consider it stolen. <laughs> Michael, Bonnie, let's jump into the more part of the four more. Can you tell our listeners where they can find out more about you, more about your current mentoring and business, your current book? And, uh, and I know you don't own Barefoot Wines anymore, but where can people find out more about Barefoot Wines? 
Well, if they want to find out about us, that you know, we we really are the barefoot spirit. You know, that's our brand, the barefoot spirit. And so uh, we have the barefootspirit.com. Uh, our book is called The Barefoot Spirit. Um, and uh, you can get, uh, you can go to uh, Barefoot uh, Audiobook. Uh, so we're easy to find. And we're also Michael and Bonnie, you know, we're on all social media. You'll find us. Uh, LinkedIn. <clears throat> as far as the wine is concerned, I mean, it's in every store and they're doing a fantastic job. You can just go to barefootwine.com. And I'm sure that they'll be very happy to hear from you. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> Michael, Bonnie, this has been absolutely awesome. I'm sitting here taking notes and that's why I'm like a, a, a few seconds behind here because there's so much great stuff here. Thank you so much for being with us. We, we were so excited about talking to you. You didn't let us down. And uh, we look forward to hearing about the next chapter and bringing you back in a couple of years when you jump into your next entrepreneurial venture. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. This has been a blast. Thank yeah, you both great, so guys. much. This has been great. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Love, love, love that show. Those two are fantastic. The, the, the dynamics and the chemistry between them, it, it really, it doesn't surprise me that they were able to build and scale a huge business between them. I know, right? And they've been working together forever and they keep doing more and more and they do it well. It's, it's kind of encouraging, honey. There is hope for the two of us. We can maybe make it forever and ever and ever and keep doing our business ventures amazingly. That's my goal. I'm yeah, very and, and, very and, yeah, maybe one day we'll have the largest wine brand on the planet. Oh yeah, we're, we're good. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, there are so many great things in that episode. And what, oh my God, I don't even know. There are so many tips that were so good, but I am especially just, I keep going back in my mind about the whole concept of planning your exit strategy for your business on day one, because it just really clarifies all of your goals. I think that was such a hugely important tip. And I just love everything about that concept. I agree. Okay. I think the, uh, the Novocaine is wearing off your mouth and it's time to get you that glass of wine that you've been that, waiting for for the last hour. an attractive visual. I really appreciate that, honey. No really. problem. Okay. So with that in mind, she's Carol. I'm Jay. Now go build an amazing brand today. Have a great day, everybody. Don't go to the bye, dentist. Everybody. But if you need to, just go. Okay, bye. Go drink <laughs> some wine. See you, everybody.